to see you, you'll excommunicate yourselves. <laughs> Cut off all communication to the outside world. For We are from now on trying to do a better quality of recording that will be available in the long term, but at this stage we simply record the talking head. <laughs> and then we edit in the PowerPoint. So eventually full sets will become available, we hope, at a much higher quality than you know anything today. Okay, good. Let's pray together this morning. Lord, you alone, apart from ourselves, know best what we've been coping with already this morning, the things that we're going to have to cope with when we go back out. So this isn't a time to escape, but it is a time, like the psalmist, to come and honestly open ourselves to your presence as the psalmist came up to the house of the Lord, so is it where we come before you and ask that you will enable us to see life, to see our own circumstances from your perspective and to know that no matter what the circumstances, you actually may not lift us out of them, but you promise to be with us in them, even in the valley of the shadow. So, that gives us the encouragement to know that study is then but a first step towards a deeper understanding and a richer expression of our worship. In that spirit we pray, deeply dependent and wonderfully expectant in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, we've been starting to explore a journey that's taking us really from Genesis, from Eden, right through ultimately to the New Jerusalem, where we'll meet the garden again in the tent, or in the city that comes down from above. And an essential part of our journey for the next number of weeks is this portable structure called the tent of meeting. And that it's portable is not accidental. For our point of view, the story starts really with Exodus. And where God intrudes into history, where he sets the people free. Now you look, we've seen that you can't read the first five books of the Bible without your hiking books. The story, the narrative brings you from Mesopotamia up through, down into Israel. By the end of Genesis, you have left Israel, you're down into Egypt. You leave Egypt in Exodus, you come into the Sinai Peninsula. There at Sinai, God enters into a relationship with Israel. He explores it further in terms of Leviticus. They journey then out into the wilderness in the book of Numbers, or in the wilderness, Bamidbar as it's called in the Hebrew Bible, and then back up to this size, east side of the Jordan. Now, we're going to stop down at Sinai. We're going... Now, to this day, nobody is, there's a traditional site for Sinai, but actually, from a biblical perspective, nobody knows the exact site. And I'm wondering if that's deliberate in God's part. Because if the Israelites, you know, had been a little group of Irish Catholics, they'd probably have come to Sinai, built a shrine, and they'd have gone back to that shrine every year. And if the Israelites had been a group of wee Ulster prods, well, they would have made a traditional route round the mountain and they'd have been marching there ever since. <laughs> it's as if the Lord says, no, look, it is that I have acted, not when or where, that is important. So at Sinai, there's a celebration of God bringing his people into this incredible experience of freedom and liberty. That crossing of the Red Sea is like a prototype a prototype for all later salvation. Because you think about it, whether you're in Exodus or you're in the Gospels, the fundamental divine way of operating is the same, the modus operandi. Because whether you're in Exodus or the Gospels, God works through the man of his choice, who brings proofs of God's existence in him. He confronts alien totalitarian enslaving powers, to bring his people through an experience of death, take them through waters and bring them to freedom. 
Now you see, those fundamental principles are true, whether you're in the Torah or you're in the Gospels, because the divine methodology doesn't change. This is why God is so consistent with himself. So this is about a liberation event, whether you're in the ancient world or the modern world, because Jesus, of course, accomplished the ultimate exodus. The Lord brought Israel not just to Sinai, but the text of Exodus says, I brought you to myself. Just didn't bring them to a place. He brought them to a person. So at the very heart of this ongoing experience, there is relationship. A relationship that has mutuality, reciprocity, identity, intimacy. It's about walking on with God because we saw last week that from actually a traditionally Jewish perspective, what happened at Mount Sinai is a marriage event. The glory cloud that came down hovering over the mountain is represented in a modern Jewish wedding by the chuppah, by the canopy that, under which the couple will get married. So there's powerful symbolism there. There's a written contract, as there was the written tablets. There is a ritual immersion and a cleansing. And then there is, of course, the nuptial home. Because the God of Sinai comes down the mountain and he presences himself with his bride. So that what we're looking at as we study this tent of meeting, it is really a nuptial home. Now, we're going to spend an entire week just looking at the sheer mystery of how a God from above can live below. That is just so rich. We'll spend an entire week on that. But for now, this is the nuptial home. He has revealed himself to Israel. He now comes down the mountain. And he's going to presence himself and he's going to journey with them. Now, when we look at this structure... This is why it's important. We're going to take a little while today to explore the idea of sacred space <coughs> and sacred time. And then, before the end of today, look at the implications of this, actually, for you and me in 211. So this is never just ancient history. It is never just abstract theological truth. You'll find time after time, without ever allegorizing or spiritualizing, but just following the track of biblical thought, this becomes incredibly practical, very much down to earth. So when we look at this sanctuary, this actually, in human terms, you might say it was empty, because there was no image, there was no picture, there was no idol, there was no attempt to give any visualization of God himself. In fact, he comes, we'll explore, to live between... Well, actually, when you look at the, the Hebrew text, it's very hard to find the preposition that's there because you're never sure whether he's in the cheruvim, between the cheruvim, on the cheruvim, at the cheruvim. It's as if <clears throat> the little preposition's meant to say, look, you can't tie me down to a specific place. So here, you've got this tent. From a human point of view, it looks empty. It is portable. That in itself is significant. It doesn't house God. This isn't God packaged for the journey. It doesn't house him. And it is a place he can enter. So this is where we're going to look at this portable sanctuary. But what I want us to do now, a lot of this stuff that we're going to do over the next few weeks, I want you, now every week will stand on its own, it has to. But I want to encourage you, and this is not simply sales talk, I want you to try to get to the, <coughs> the whole series because there's a cumulative impact. We'll build week by week towards an incredible crescendo when we come to the book of Revelation. But we've got to get there, and because this is fairly alien territory to us, and this is a very different way of looking at this material, we're going to have to go quite slowly at times. Because I don't want you to miss the richness of this. But this will take you, I promise you, outside the traditional Northern Iron Box. Way outside it. Way outside it. 
But the richness of what you'll discover in the end is just so quite phenomenal. What we've got, <coughs> and this is why it's good, examine this structure, get to know it. When we look at this structure, what we've got effectively is a veritable extension of Mount Sinai. What happened at Mount Sinai virtually becomes portable in this sanctuary because this building, this structure, now we can call it tent, temple, or um, tabernacle, or sometimes it's called in Hebrew thought the Mishkan. Now let's look at this word Mishkan for a minute. Because Mishkan is one of these fascinating words. It's got a history, it's got a genealogy, and it's interesting to look at its relatives. We've said before that virtually every Hebrew word has three root letters. Three consonants that lie at the root. Now this is true right through even to virtually to modern Hebrew. And where you get these three root letters, you've got a basic idea that will then carry through no matter what the word uh, is where they're found. Now, when we look at these basic three letters of this word Mishkan, we're going to discover behind them are the three letters. Now, SH, although it's two letters in English, is originally one letter in, in Hebrew. It's just one letter. Then you've got the K when we translate.